Good day, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's edition of Teneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York City. China's annual parliament session, the National People's Congress, that ended this past weekend, marked the end of a series of meetings and documents, including the 20th Party Congress, the 14th Five Year Plan, and the Central Economic Work Conference, which institutionalized the priorities of China and the Chinese Communist Party and solidified the positions of the country and party's leadership, not least Xi Jinping's third term as president and continued leadership of the party and the military. Meanwhile, relations with the United States continue to be dynamic, to say the least, while President Xi and President Biden attempted to put a floor under the deterioration of this most complex and most essential bilateral relationship, the balloon incident, the new select committee uh, in Congress on China, and looming elections next year in both Taiwan and the United States uh, suggest that relations are only going to become more complicated. So to help us understand these dynamics and other elements of Chinese uh, foreign and economic policy, I'm joined today by three experts in the field. Ling Li uh, uh, is a teacher of politics and law at the University of Vienna and a non-resident fellow at NYU Law. She is an expert on Chinese law and politics, focusing on the party state dynamic and the institutional practices of the Chinese Communist Party. She also writes extensively on Chinese law and is an expert on corruption and anti-corruption policies there as well. I'm happy to have Professor Li join us for the first time from Vienna, Austria today. My other guests will be familiar to many of you. Gabe Wildow is a Teneo Managing Director and he leads our coverage of China in the United States. He spent about 15 years in China, most recently as the Shanghai Bureau Chief of the Financial Times. And Paul Hanley uh, joins from Singapore. He's Teneo's chairman in the Asia Pacific region. He served in the Obama and George W. Bush White Houses as the China Director on the National Security Council. Uh, and he was the White House representative to the six party nuclear talks. Um, and uh, he was also a special assistant to the National Security Advisors, Condoleezza Rice and Steve Hadley. So thank you all for uh, for joining this morning. And let's let's jump right into it. And Professor Lee, maybe I'll I'll start with you, as I mentioned, in the opening, you know, we've kind of come to the end of this long, uh, long process, and there've been a lot of data points uh, in there in both the meetings and the um, and the working documents that have come out of them. So, you know, I'd love to have start with maybe an overview from you of your observations of how we should be interpreting uh, this series of uh, there is this series of events and what you know China and its leadership is trying to trying to show. Okay, uh, first of all. The, we need to understand a lot of leadership changes had been set at the 20th Party Congress and uh, what the Party Congress elects are memberships to the top decision-making bodies. That means uh, it's almost like a qualification for top jobs, but uh, it's not decided at that point of time which portfolio each member of these decision-making bodies will take. And many of that decisions are set afterwards. Uh, if it's a party position, then it can be set before the People's Congress, but if it involves any state positions, it has to be formalized at the People's Congress. And that's what happened uh, one week ago. And uh, when the Politburo Standing Committee members uh, were determined at the 20th Party Congress, although there's no official uh, designation of portfolio, but because the Politburo Standing Committee membership, there's a sequence of order. So usually there's a convention which position, depending on which position you are in, and that position is usually packed to a particular position in the state or uh, in the party. And so we can already we could already speculate which positions each member of the Power Bureau Standing Committee will be taking at that time. And that 
uh, uh, that estimation or assessment has been proved true, has been observed the old convention uh, as is shown at the People's Congress. So we see the second position at the Politburo Standing Committee was taken by the Premier Li Qiang. And uh, uh, by the way, there's a, when, when I'm talking about convention and also the location position in the sequence of lineup at the Polo's Bureau Standing Committee, it's not always observed. For example, the sixth and seventh positions, sometimes it might be reversed. Sometimes the sixth position is for the top of the CCDI, the party uh, disciplinary institution, and the last position is for the uh, uh, first deputy premier of the state council. But sometimes it's reversed. So it's not 100% set in stones and things can change. But this time, uh, the old, the, the last convention has been largely observed, and Li Qiang was a premier, uh, uh, was elected as a premier, and Zhao Leji took the People's Congress, and Li Xi, uh, that Li Xi's position was already determined as the party congress, uh, as a head of the CCDI, and the uh, vice premier, uh, Ding Xue Xiang, uh, and also the, the head of the uh, CCPPC, uh, the, the Chinese uh, People's Political Consultants Conference. So there's no surprise at all about the allocation of these positions. Uh, as to the lower positions, because they were taken by members of the Politburo and members of the Central Committee at the lower level. But when the Party Congress uh, finished, uh, those membership, there's no sequence of order. So we didn't know who is going to be appointed to which position. So there's no estimation. So we, 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 we wouldn't be surprised because we, we cannot predict uh, with uh, 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 reliable uh, certainty. Um, but in terms of the allocation of different seats at the power bureau level, uh, we can see a, a measure of diversity. It's not not all members from the power bureau are from Zhejiang or Fujian, which are the typical clique of Xi Jinping. We also have figures hailed from different parts of the country who does not seem to have an overlap in terms of working experience or place of origin with Xi Jinping. Uh, so it's quite diversified. It's not all Xi's men. However, at the Politburo Standing Committee, uh, except the two, uh, uh, two persons who continued their Politburo Standing Committee membership from the last term, uh, all the new uh, promotions were Xi Jinping's people, either from uh, Zhejiang or from Fujian. Uh, so that's on the front of personnel. In terms of the institutional reform, we know there has been a continuation of the institutional reform that started in 2018. Uh, this time, uh, the the scale of the institutional reform is a little bit smaller than the last time. Uh, last time, it's implicated so many ministries and uh, so many uh, new commissions were established. And uh, a lot of them uh, were not changed. They, they stay where they were. But this time, there's uh, significant changes regarding uh, the regulation on the financial front. Uh, and there had been rumored proposal that there will be an internal uh, uh, interior commission uh, and the public security ministry and state security ministry will be taken out of the state council and put directly under the party. And that didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen uh, because I, 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 I was forced to speculate uh, because there's this rumor. So to give the rumor uh, some credibility, I thought uh, if there's no change regarding the state structure and the function of the Ministry of Public Security and internal uh, state security, uh, there might be some changes on the party front. For example, taking these two ministries out of the uh, supervision from the political legal committee and put it in a different 
a uh, special committee such as uh, in in interior commission but that didn't happen either uh, i just received uh, the new reform plan uh, on both front party and the state which were published like uh, 40 minutes ago uh, and that didn't happen either uh, so the institutional reform seems quite controlled um, and we can talk more about that later uh, but uh, I, I believe it's uh, it's more controlled and contained than many people were expecting um, there's another major change of uh, activity that took place at the People's Congress, which was the uh, passage of uh, an amendment of the legislative law. Um, it's uh, quite technical, uh, but the major change is to allow the National People's Congress, in particular the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, to suspend certain laws, uh, not only in uh, a specified region, but nationwide, that is also possible now uh, to suspend law uh, and to experiment some kind of uh, reform programs in, in the form of pilot projects. Uh, previously, the, the, the party just do it. I mean, they, they just issue a directive by the National People's Congress. We're going to do a pilot project here or there uh, without regarding to uh, the fact that the pilot project would violate the uh, current legislation. But now there has been, uh, it, it's added to the legal system so that to put uh, this kind of uh, experimental reforms into the legal parameters. Uh, which is aligned to the uh, rule on the uh, to govern uh, according to the law uh, political project that has been advocated by Xi Jinping all, all the time since he took office 10 years ago. So um, if, if I could just bring Paul Hanley in from, from Singapore for one moment, because uh, I know, Paul, you just returned from, from a series of meetings in Washington, you are at the White House and you're meeting a lot of other foreign policy specialists and the like. And I'm just wondering, I want to follow up on Professor Lee's, you know, um, uh, observations here and, and A, ask you if you, if that aligns with your interpretation, number one, but more, perhaps more, more importantly, um, is Washington viewing these changes in the, in the way that Professor Lee is sort of uh, uh, interpreting? Well, thanks, Kevin. Um, and, and Professor Lee gave, gave an excellent uh, and very comprehensive overview. Um, you know, the mood in, in Washington on China, broadly speaking, is, is, is quite negative these days. Uh, but I think it has more to do with the Chinese spy balloon incident um, and concerns over China potentially providing legal assistance to Russia uh, than it does in terms of their concerns on the National People's Congress or the two meetings. I think uh, on, on that aspect, I think most uh, policymakers in the U.S. saw what Professor Lee said, which is a continuation of the trends that we've been seeing for quite a while, continuity coming out of the 20th, 20th Party Congress as well. And in that regard, what I mean in terms of trends are party wanting more say in government affairs and the state council. Uh, party in the past has really set direction, and then the state council would carry out the implementation of that. Uh, and there used to be a strong division of work, but I, I think, you know, the trends that we're seeing is uh, changing along those lines uh, will, will continue. Um, and I think it's fairly clear the trend for the party is to increasingly want more control over the state. Um, and that, I think, is the view from Washington. Um, there were some surprises, as Professor Lee pointed out, but overall, I think it's clear that those are the trends politically. Now, at the same time, um, it was also noticed that even while we see shifts in this regard and more emphasis on national security at the 20th Party Congress, it is clear that the Chinese Communist Party was also trying to send signals that it will remain focused on the economy as a central part of overall national strength. The economy is not in great shape. Um, and in terms of the priorities that the leadership laid out at the National People's Congress, they seem to be quite pragmatic. Uh, importance of the private sector, for example, wanting more 
uh, to attract more foreign directed investment, uh, to ensure national treatment for foreign companies. So, you know, these are, I think, received well by international businesses and investors. Uh, it's noteworthy that common prosperity agenda was, was in a sense, downplayed. Uh, we also saw uh, that um, the leadership kept on the central bank governor, Egon, uh, they kept on the finance and the commerce ministers as well. I think that reflects probably some anxiety uh, in, in China among the leadership about keeping international companies and investors in the game. President Xi and the leadership do not want to see large scale decoupling. Uh, they want to attract foreign investment, especially after three years of isolation in the current state of the economy. So I think those reappointments were probably intended to, in part, to reassure uh, international markets. The institutional reforms that Pro Professor Lee mentioned on public security and state security that were quite controlled and contained, that may be a part of it as well, not wanting to spook the international community. But let me just conclude with this, because I think at the end of the day, there does seem to be uh, some conflicting impulses at play. On one hand, you see the party projecting very pragmatic approach at the National People's Congress um, to economic affairs. On the other hand, it's clear that the party wants to further strengthen political and ideological control of the private sector and to make sure that economic management is in line with the party's priorities. So I think until the, you know, the, the Chinese Communist Party is able to show foreign companies and investors more through their actions, really, less, less rhetorically, how they plan to square that circle going forward. I think there's still going to be some uncertainty, some hesitation. China will hold the China Development Forum later this month, and there'll be a lot of multinational companies. Kevin, as you know, in fact, many of our clients will be there. Those CEOs are not blindly accepting the positive rhetoric from the MPC. They want to see real intentions behind the rhetoric and they'll be looking for those signals at the uh, China Development Forum later this month. So, Gabe, you know, um, obviously the headlines coming out of the 20th Party Congress and since then have been that Xi Jinping had essentially, you know, run the table, right? He had eliminated all opposition uh, and was going to stack um, the major bodies, particularly the standing committee, with his, uh, with his uh, loyalists. Um, but as, and, and this was evidenced in most dramatic fashion with the, uh, the removal on camera of Hu Jintao from the, uh, from the meeting. But um, as Professor Lee indicated in her earlier comments, the, in, in actuality, there's a, there's a greater amount of diversity amongst these, uh, amongst these men, and, and frankly, it is all men. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on that. You know, she, she spoke at, uh, Professor Lee spoke at length about the new Premier, Li Chang, um, Obviously, a longtime associate of Xi Jinping's, um, very closely associated with the uh, with the with the extreme lockdowns in in Shanghai during the uh, uh, during the um, pandemic. Uh, but I do wonder. I mean, he also is somebody who negotiated with Elon Musk to get the largest Tesla factory built in in Shanghai. He uh, was a political patron of the likes of Jack Ma and others. So, talk a little bit about. Some of the diversity or perhaps you know moving away from the caricatures that we sometimes get of painting uh these men as all just sort of lockstep loyalists of uh of, of president xi thanks kevin i think one of the points that is missed in a lot of the discussion around these new leaders is uh the the, the idea that they are uh simply yes men to xi uh, misses a lot of the picture insofar as, uh, you know, what we have in the key documents, the 14th five-year plan that you mentioned, the work reports from the Party Congress and the National People's Congress is a very clear policy agenda. And uh, it's, it's as Professor Lee and, 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 uh, and, and Paul both mentioned, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a more of a balance between national security and economic growth. Um, and uh, these individuals, including Li Shang and the vice premiers uh, uh, that, that serve under him, they, they, I think they have a record of competence uh, in, in their ability to execute those tasks and those objectives laid out in the report. So I, I think it would be a mistake to see these people as 
uh, people who've just risen through the ranks because they are friendly with President Xi or because they're loyal to, to President Xi. Um, these are these are men, and they are men, as you mentioned, who run some of China's largest and most economically developed provinces, Shanghai, Zhejiang, Fujian, and they they have long experience dealing with foreign companies. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, I've seen reports that uh, in line with the, the focus this year in 2023 on, on really reviving growth after the damage from zero COVID, uh, uh, government officials, um, not just at the very top level, but uh, um, at provincial officials and sub-provincial officials are, have targets met for meeting with foreign business. Um, there's, a, there's a full court press on to emphasize the message that, uh, that the new Premier Li Chang made at, at the National People's Congress and that President Xi has been emphasizing about support for foreign business and support for, for private business. And, um, and these, are, these are leaders who are, who are capable of executing on that agenda. But we need to refer back to these documents to understand what the what the strategic long term objectives are. And there's and there's very and it's very clear now that economic growth is now only one of the top priorities rather than the top priority. So so the competence question is less of an issue for me or less of a concern for me than simply what what are the objectives? And we've heard a lot of talk about you know pragmatism and you know when when uh, foreign analysts talk about oh is Li Chang a pragmatist? Uh, or these other vice premiers, pragmatists. I think what what they or and we as foreign observers tend to mean by that term is sort of um, you know globalists have has a sort of a pro, uh, uh, neoliberal outlook or a, pro, a very pro economic growth outlook, and um, you know that's just no longer the agenda for for um, uh, for, for China's top leadership. And so pragmatism um, in that context in the Chinese context means fulfilling the agenda laid out in those documents. And I, I do think they are pragmatic in, in that respect. It's just that the goals that they're pursuing are, are, are quite different. And for foreign business, you know, and the clients that, that, um, that Paul and I are advising, that's a concern because even if the leadership succeeds in implementing that agenda, it may not be to the advantage uh, of those businesses, at least to the same extent that it, it has been, you know, for most of the, the, the 2000s. And so um, the concern is, is less about competence and more about, you know, are, has, has the, have the objectives changed? So, Professor Lee, you know, notwithstanding the nuances and subtleties that you and Gabe and Paul have all just talked about in terms of the leadership, obviously there's an impression that has been given that, you know, uh, that President Xi is, is the most powerful leader in, in, in China since, uh, since Mao. And I wonder a couple of things from from you after you after you've seen all of this uh, play out. Um, maybe your assessment on on just how strong he is. But secondly, you know, um, much has been made in the last year, particularly since the invasion of Ukraine by by Russia, that it's a reminder that as sort of autocratic leaders end their tenure in office, that the quality of decision making goes down, particularly as they eliminate more of the loyal opposition, um, they are surrounded more by people who, who owe, their, owe their positions to that leader and the like, and that over time, then the quality of that decision-making goes down. And that's a very fraught question when it comes to China, considering Taiwan, considering relations with the United States, considering the dem demographic challenges that the country is facing um, and, and the, and the uh, issues around re-stimulating growth and, and, and the like. So I'm just I'm, I'm wondering what you think of Xi um, at this time and and his and his position. Um, in terms of Xi Jinping's centralization of power or personalization of power, um, it certainly has achieved a lot during the last ten years. And to give it a little bit of a context, uh, in the Chinese political system when uh, uh, the head of the party was elected to the office for the first term, you don't get to choose who you are going to work with. You don't have your own cabinet because the whole leadership composition is determined by your predecessor. 
you may have some uh, some role to play in that process, but you certainly don't have the 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 the, the uh, final say, uh, a major say in that decision making process. So you have to work with people who were chosen by other people, not yourself. Uh, and usually you get to the second term or the end of the second term, <laughs> when you have the control to nominate your own people to the cabinet, your term is going to finish up. Uh, according to the, the by, by term, I don't necessarily mean the term li limit because the party doesn't have a term limit, but by the age limit rule, which usually means you have two terms if the old rules were observed. Uh, so Xi Jinping has tried to break away from that, and that's what he has done in the last two terms to gain the opportunity that he has now to get his own cabinet. Uh, and also we can see, although the, the, the exact decision making behind the scenes, we don't know, we have very limited information about that, but from some uh, fringe information or uh, signals, we can already see how that has been played out. I'll give you one example. Uh, previously, since uh, Jiang Zemin's time, uh, the uh, the decision making process for the, the selection of national uh, state leaders, uh, which took place at the National People's Congress every five years, and two positions are very important in uh, uh, the, that two positions are the first two positions in the steering committee at the National People's Congress when it's when when it convenes. And one, uh, the first position is uh, incoming head of the National People's Congress. And the second position is also very important because that one will be in charge of the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, organization of the uh, Congress during that two weeks time. And since Jiang Zemin's time, uh, that second position was held by a Politburo Standing Committee member consistently. Uh, also during Hu Jintao's time. It has been changed when Xi Jinping, the, at the second time, uh, at the second term of Xi Jinping, because as I said, the first term, you don't have so much power. Uh, everything was determined by your predecessor. You don't have <laughs> control over the process. But from the 19th Party Congress and the People's Congress, uh, following that Congress, uh, the second seat of the steering committee of the People's Congress was taken by a member of the Central Secretariat, no longer by another Politburo Standing Committee member. And that person is usually uh, the head of the Central Organization Department. So the 19th, the, the last People's Congress, it was Chen Xi, who also has the, the, the head of the Central Organization Department. And this time, it's Li Ganjie. The, the one who's going to succeed Chen Xi as a head of the central organization department. Uh, that means before that decision, I think they will be in charge of deciding certain positions for the state institutions, at least at the lower level uh, from the top, uh, premier, uh, not premier, or probably not a deputy premier, but ministry level and down. Uh, they will determine that. Uh, but previously, it's two Politburo Standing Committee members, and now there's only one Politburo Standing Committee uh, member and another person who's lower in ranking who will directly be answering to Xi Jinping himself. So from that normative uh, point of view, Xi Jinping is uh, taking more control of things. And now because he has his trusted person in those important uh, positions, uh, a functional department, he can delegate those power to them and through them have a wider control of the process over a wider range of things. And we can see that consistently played out in different fields. Uh, for example, in the uh, the legal system, uh, Chen Wenqing now at the uh, Zheng Fa Wei and Wang Xiaohong at the Ministry of uh, Public Security. So he can delegate more since he has more of his people now have risen to the appropriate rank to take these positions. And through these people, he can uh, reach to more sectors uh, and uh, have close 
uh, monitoring of these sectors. Uh, so from that point of view, he indeed has centralized power finally uh, at the end of his second term. And, and how do you, and, and then just to follow up on that, how do you feel that is going to impact the quality of his decision making, particularly on these like highly, highly critical and potentially consequential issues such as U.S. relations, Taiwan relations, um, and, and the like? Um, it can go both ways. Uh, one way is if you have yes men and the yes man only says yes, and the other way is because these people have a more trusting relationship with with him if they are yes men but with some characteristics of with character they will be more emboldened to tell the truth uh, to say things that Xi Jinping probably wouldn't like to hear uh, if we give the story by Reuters any credibility that uh, uh, Li Qiang had contributed to the uh, uh, ending of the zero COVID policy, uh, then that plays out as a second scenario. Uh, they're yes men, they're loyal, but they are also more emboldened to present the truth to the leader. So uh, I think we need more information to make a conclusive assessment uh, how that's going to be. Paul, you want to do? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to jump in. I, I I just wanted to say one thing. I, I I agree with Professor Lee very much that she's been very successful in consolidating his consolidating his power. Um, I don't think there's there's any obvious challenge to him at this point. Um, and you mentioned Kevin, you know, Hu Jintao being escorted out at the 20th Party Congress, and relatedly the Chinese Youth League, or the Communist Youth League, the the uh, faction that he represents frankly, being decimated at the 20th Party Congress. They may be out, the Communist Youth League, but, you know, China, we, we, we can't forget, China operates on a sort of a guanxi, you know, relationship net and associated networks model. And the guanxi network, the relationships network that political leaders build are important, and they ultimately become, can become factions in themselves. And so we talked about it, I think, on the last call. Um, you know, these... Um, these networks, these Guanxi networks, involve deep bonds and personal obligations. Old factions die, generally new ones emerge. Um, Xi's, President Xi's anti-corruption campaign, you know, getting rid of, part of it is getting rid of potential rivals. I don't think that's dead. And I would not be surprised if we see going forward some very high level senior takes, takedowns, uh, even this year. Uh, she will want to get out in front of these new factions forming, certain Guanxi networks becoming too powerful. We saw him do this before in taking down the head of, of security, um, a standing committee member, former standing committee member, vice chairman of the Central Military Commission. Even Jack Ma, you know, represented a, a, a growing faction of sorts in the new technology sector, and he was he was taken out. So I think this will be important to watch going forward uh, on this question. Again, I agree with Professor Lee that she has done a you know considerable job in consolidating his power, but given that he is now clearly in charge, and there's no one under him that you know, I mean certainly I, I take the point that uh, they're not just yeah I don't I don't I don't like the phrase yes men I don't think they're all yes men I think they're capable uh, leaders I think they're smart and capable and I do think that they will uh, tell President Xi how they feel. But it does create a risk for President Xi that he has his political allies around him, because if policies go poorly, if the economy doesn't get back, uh, get back, you know, get going again, if the China-Russia strategic relationship turns out badly for him, he has no one to point to. He doesn't have a Li Keqiang anymore. Um, and so the last point I'll make is, you know, Chinese leaders spend their entire career being paranoid. Uh, frankly, I think they live their entire life being paranoid. So I think even with President Xi securing his third term, un unprecedented, uh, consolidating his power in a very strong way, I, I don't expect him to rest on his laurels or, or feel easy going forward. Yeah. As Richard Nixon said, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't out to get you. So, um, but just, uh, I, I want to return to corruption in a few minutes here, Paul, but while I've got you, uh, I wanted to pivot just a little bit and ask you, 
you know, about how you think this elite level politics then influences or impacts uh, foreign policy coming out of China. Now, obviously, it was lost on no one uh, that uh, during Xi Jinping's speech um, and, 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 and others uh, at the People's Congress that he, um, in a rare departure, kind of called out the United States by name specifically, right? That, uh, that the, and accused the U.S. of all around containment, encirclement, and suppression of China. Um, you know, um, on the other hand, you know, we have seen uh, some a pretty dramatic foray in, uh, in the Middle East uh, as, the, as China supposedly brokered uh, the uh, rapprochement, diplomatically at least, between Saudi Arabia and, um, uh, and, and Iran. And, and of course, there's the nature of this unlimited friendship, quote unquote, with, uh, with Russia and the risk that the United States is continuing to put out there that China, and you mentioned this earlier, that China may supply lethal weaponry to, to Russia and try to tilt the balance of the, uh, of the conflict. Um, how do you see the foreign policy element playing out in the wake of, uh, of the leadership changes and priorities laid out in the, uh, in the plans? Well, I think we're seeing domestic politics play a pretty significant role in foreign policy, frankly, both in China and the United States. Um, and, and we see that with the U.S. Select Committee on China, the bipartisan kind of approach to being much more, much tougher on China. Um, in, uh, in, in China, I think that, you know, you mentioned the statements that were made by President Xi for the first time, I think, calling out the United States for encircling uh, and containing China. Uh, normally, he says, you know, uh, some countries or unnamed countries. Uh, this was the first time he called it out, called the United States out. Uh, that's concerning, frankly, because, you know, you can bet after these, you know, National uh, People's Congress meetings, the remarks that President Xi make uh, get studied at all levels by party committee and committees and other organizations. And so this will send a signal uh, that, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, that the U.S.-China, that it's time to be tough with the U.S. and push back with the U.S. So that's unfortunate. But, you know, you can see the domestic politics, how it plays into foreign policy. I'll give you an example. If, if you read uh, the statements that were made after Secretary Blinken and Wang Yi met at the Munich Security Conference. That will give you a big indication of how domestic politics plays into foreign policy. Both of the statements went through what each of the individuals said to the other. So for example, Blinken statement says that, you know, he spoke to Wang Yi about the un unacceptable violation of UN sovereign US sovereignty. That, uh, you know, he warned uh, Wang Yi about the implications of providing lethal assistance to Russia and that he reiterated the U.S. will compete unapologetically. Um, and the Chinese statement, um, first of all, it started out saying at the request of the U.S. side, Wang Yi met with Blinken. So they couldn't even, you know, they needed to let it out there that uh, they were meeting only because the U.S. side uh, had asked for the meeting. Uh, but then, of course, it went through, you know, Wang Yi, you know, explained China's strong position on the balloon and Wang Yi stressed, you know, this issue and he pointed out it was a it was a regurgitation of what each gentleman said to the other, um, and I think in large part that is geared toward domestic audiences uh, back in the United States uh, and China, and we saw that from the beginning, frankly, at the Alaska meeting. You know, when when uh, Secretary of State Blinken and Jake Sullivan met their counterparts in Alaska, the rhetoric and exchange was quite angry and heated, and of course that was in front of uh, of the media and they knew that that would be uh, played back home. And so in a sense, the audience was not in the room, it was back home. Um, and that's why I think the outcome of the Biden's peace summit in Bali in November was so important because both of those leaders had the wind at their back coming out of their own domestic political events that allowed them to come into that meeting in a relatively strong position. Both leaders came in. Biden uh, and the, the U.S. midterms, uh, the Democrats, to, you know, beat the historic trends. And Xi Jinping, you know, as we said, ran the, ran the table of 20th Party Congress. So they used their relatively strong positions domestically to try to stabilize the relationship. Uh, we were on that path. Blinken's visit was a part of that effort. But the balloon incident and now these concerns over lethal assistance um, have, you know, created complications. 
The news that uh, Speaker of the House McCarthy will not go to Taiwan this year, I think, is helpful. Um, the chair of the Select Committee, Mike Gallagher, had suggested he would hold uh, hearings on Taiwan. Um, and then he visited secretly, didn't tell anybody until he returned. And when asked about hearings, said, well, they may do them on Guam. So, uh, you know, there are indications that perhaps, you know, we have APEC, uh, the U.S. is hosting APEC at the end of this year in the fall. Um, and I suspect Biden will want President Xi there, and I suspect President Xi will want to be there himself. So that may be a forcing function mechanism that will allow our two leaders to try to put the relationship on better, better footing despite the domestic politics in both capitals, but it's hard, hard to tell at this point. So I want to turn to Gabe and the economy here in just one moment, but because you brought up the balloon, I want to ask you one thing. You know, um, it was interesting to note yesterday, uh, following the incident with the drone in the Black Sea, um, uh, that um, Secretary Austin, uh, the Defense Secretary of the United States, had a uh, was quickly able to have a conversation with his counterpart in um, in Russia, and it sort of demonstrated again that sort of the military to military relationship and contacts between the United States and Russia sort of remains on better footing um, than it does between the United States military and the Chinese military. And the balloon incident, although overall in the end sort of a benign situation, it did put on stark display that there is not a great institutionalized crisis management function between the United States and China. Is that is that a fair assessment and is that concerning um, when you've got a lot more potentially more dangerous um, contact that could be that could be made in the South and East China Seas. I mean, look, from an American perspective, I, I find it concerning. Um, from a, and, and from a broad perspective, I think the U.S. and China do want to avoid conflict, but it is difficult to set up these guardrails, crisis management mechanisms in the current environment. Uh, outreach to the other side is often viewed in, as we said, in the domestic political environment in both countries as a sign of weakness. We've also heard the Chinese view uh, pretty clearly that guardrails, military uh, dialogue, crisis management mechanisms, they see those almost as a tacit acceptance of U.S. military activity in the region. And they would rather the U.S. You know, pull back uh, in terms of its military activity from the region. They don't want to give the U.S. military an out should the, you know, the U.S. Uh, military push the issue and have some crisis. So, you know, the, what they say is China, Chinese PLA will say, we don't want our, your military in China's backyard. So why would we want to establish these mechanisms to give you an out should something happen? Um, and we can see the negative view towards these guardrails. As you say, during the balloon incident, the Chinese defense minister would, wouldn't answer Secretary of Defense Austin's phone call. So I think, you know, in the U.S. view, it's precisely during those difficult incidents like the balloon that these channels become critical. But we often see the Chinese, on the other hand, close down their communication channels instead. So even despite all that, I do think the Biden administration will continue to try to press the Chinese to implement more robust crisis management mechanisms, but I think it's gonna be challenging. Okay, so Gabe, so um, you know, I think you mentioned earlier in your in your remarks that there's been this kind of rebalancing over the over this uh, last six month period uh, of of growth imperatives uh, and market oriented economics with national security and and uh, and communist ide ideology. Um, and so, you know, we know that the the new growth target has been put out there of around five percent, which sounds uh, you know not all that exciting. Uh, we know that there are economic headwinds that the country is uh, facing and everything from the, uh, the housing market to, um, you know, the fact that they've got to create uh, something like 12 million new urban jobs this year. You've got 11 and a half million uh, college graduates um, uh, from university in 2023, as an example. Um, but we've also seen some data that the, uh, that the rebound um, coming out of the zero COVID period is, pre is pretty dramatic. So I guess, um, you know, what are your assessments of the, uh, of the economic policies coming out as, as well as sort of the starting point that, they, that they've got to uh, build off of uh, from here? And there was a lot of rhetorical championing by the president and others, again, of, uh, of the private sector. And I'm wondering how you're reading that. I think this year is pivotal for 
perceptions of the Chinese economy over the next sort of five to 10 years among foreign investors in particular, because we're coming out of this zero COVID period um, and we're coming out of this period of crackdowns on the housing sector and on the tech sector. And, um, and we're still in this period of political risk, geopolitical risk, which is, which is definitely not going away. So the economy is crucial in terms of um, do foreign companies and foreign investors, are they willing to brave these political risks? Because if growth is strong, if growth is five and a half, six percent, then it's worth it to brave the political risks because the market opportunity is still very strong. But if um, if growth is weak, then why why uh, deal with the headaches, the political and geopolitical risks associated with doing business in China? And so that is why I think, you know, the short term focus this year for policy is, is clearly on um, on reviving growth. And um, but at the same time, I think Paul raised this question, you know, how far are they willing to back up uh, the rhetoric uh, about the private sector with um, with with action and, and how much action really is necessary? Because what we've already seen is I mean, a lot can be accomplished in terms of reviving growth simply by um, Stop digging. You know, don't you've ended zero. So so you're no longer crashing the economy, you know, more or less intentionally by the zero COVID policy and by these harsh, harsh controls on the housing sector and the cracks on real estate. So how much growth can be revived simply by stopping what you were doing before versus you actually need to take more proactive steps to, you know, aggressively implement the kind of market reforms that Western economists have been advising for many years? Uh, that is a key question this year is, you know, do animal spirits revive enough? Do the, the so-called revenge spending coming out of zero COVID carry the economy, um, uh, you know, a long way towards maybe surpassing that 5% growth target? Um, do reversing the, the controls on the housing sector lead to, a, you know, a significant rebound in housing? Or is it, are we in a long-term, you know, slump of the housing sector due primarily to these demographic factors and the overbuilding of housing that's occurred over the last decade? So, um, you know, this is a hinge year, I think, for China's economy. The early data, the data over the, nat over the last few months has been positive. Um, and I think that 5% growth target will be met and, and most likely exceeded. That's what most economists are, are um, expecting. Uh, so, uh, but, but there's a worry that, that, you know, once this initial wave of post-zero COVID cons consumer spending um, occurs and then starts to subside, you know, what are the more long-term uh, growth drivers? Are they still in place to, to power, you know, growth well above 5% not only this year, but in future years? And uh, I think foreign investors are watching closely because, you know, there is a degree of pessimism uh, among foreign investors and foreign businesses, but it's, it's very hard to disentangle the sources of those pessimism between zero COVID, which is now over, the tech crackdown, which is now at least on hold, if not if not over, um, and so you know we will see where policymakers strike that balance between growth and other objectives like national security um, going forward. But uh, you know a year from now, there's a scenario where where the mood towards China among businesses is a lot different. If growth comes back, um, a lot of these geopolitical concerns. They're still going to exist, but it's it's just going to be viewed as a price of doing business rather than a reason to really pull back on China exposure. And what do you think, Gabe? I mean, you know, another element here is that really for the first time since COVID, we've seen all of the um, uh, all the visa restrictions uh, going into China now is starting to be lifted. Um, so we're going to see a rush of American CEOs and other Western CEOs going back to China to sort of reinvigorate uh, relationships, personal relationships uh, in business and in government and elsewhere that had obviously atrophied over the last few years, like everybody's um, uh, did, and they're going to have those face-to-face -face meetings again for the first time. What are they going to, uh, what are they going to find, do you think? And um, I mean, because, you know, um, at, 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 concurrent with all, everything we've been talking about, you know, the big rhetorical theme in, in when you look at global, the global economy has been decoupling and diversifying of supply chains and so on and so forth. Now, the data doesn't support that wholesale yet, obviously. Um, but China obviously has something to sell here as well, right? I mean, that they have got economies of scale. They have got the sophistication of their logistics. They've got this incredibly sophisticated 
uh, supply chain mechanism and network um, that has been built up over over decades that's not going to be replicated anywhere easily so they've got something to sell and it occurs to me that with Washington increasingly bipartisan in its hawkishness against China that corporate America is is, is seen as um, as still somebody to do business with by the Chinese in terms of you know having a positive influence in Washington so what do you think CEOs are going to encounter as they start to return to China for the first time? I think they're going to encounter a, uh, a, a message from the from Chinese officials that China is open for business, like we heard outgoing Premier uh, Li Keqiang say, or excuse me, outgoing Vice Premier Liu He say at, at Davos, uh, China is open for business. They're going to be re-emphasizing the advantages, the long-standing advantages I think we're all familiar with around uh, supply chains, around you know high quality, uh, the ability to do high quality manufacturing quickly and reliably. And and you know the implicit message that there's no replacement for us. You know, we're seeing marginal moves by the likes of Apple and Google to diversify away from China, but diversification is a lot different from replacement. And I think we're going to I think the CEOs visiting China will, will hear that message from Chinese leaders that, that, you know, there's there's no one better than us at doing what we do and that we're going to be a reliable supplier going forward. And that, uh, you know, we don't intend to cut you guys off, that if the risk is coming from your own government, from Western governments that, that are pressuring you to decouple. And I don't know that they'll say this message directly, but the, the implied message from, from Chinese officials is going to be we need you to. Uh, to push back against the political trends in your in your home uh, mark in your home governments uh, towards decoupling because it's bad for the world. Um, globalization is good, and uh, you've benefited from globalization. We've benefited from it. We want it to continue, and we're going to treat you well. Um, and uh, we're going to create a growth environment that allows you to prosper. Now, of course, that message will be greeted with a degree of skepticism. But as I said before, I think, you know, the growth story overall in China will tell the tale. It will go a lot further than any of those uh, assurances from from um, government officials that China it's worth staying in China. Um, so, you know, and, and they'll say that, you know, zero COVID is over. It was I mean, future pandemics could come. But um, the, the supply chain disruptions associated with zero COVID, you know, aren't as much of a concern uh, going forward because uh, because that's all in the past. So, Professor Lee, both both Paul and Gabe have brought up the, the the issue of corruption, and I want to ask you because I know you've done a lot of work on this in your in your career, and I want to ask you um, about it in the context of what Gabe was just talking about. We have seen these kind of crackdowns sort of move from industry to industry, and I'm and I'm and I'm wondering if it is um, if there's a particular reason uh, for focusing. Is it just sort of it's uh, it's time to focus on this industry and clean it out, and then focus on this industry and clean it out? And I'm wondering if there are sometimes issues of whether the right hand knows what the left hand is doing, um, because you get these sort of mixed messages. To Gabe's point about Liu He's speech at Davos and whatnot, that we are open for business, um, and the lifting of the of the crackdown on the tech sector. At the same time, then we have the disappearance of Bao Fan, uh, the investment banker, both best known in the West, investment banker, best known for his technology related deals and whatnot, whatnot, just sort of disappearing, which would seem to send a more of a chilling effect again at the same time, in contrast with that more welcoming uh, rhetoric. So how do you how should we interpret the the, the anti corruption moves and specifically around uh, the disappearance of Bao Fan? Um, well, yes. Uh, yeah. Bao Fan is an individual case. I don't think it necessarily negates the trend of welcoming gesture that Liu He is trying to signal to the rest of the world. And there's one thing that has caught my attention in anti-corruption activities in the last couple of years, which is uh, increasing concern uh, on the side of the party about uh, the politicians or politics being captured by the business group, uh, which is probably quite common in Western democracies where uh, you need money to finance political campaigns so that the business group who supports one particular politician can have 
uh, a lot of say which exactly politician they want to support. But in China, it has never been the case because the business, uh, they don't have real political power. They can collude with the politician, but all the political matters, including personnel matters, it's decided by the party in the very top down fashion. And I think there has been, I don't have cases to substantiate that, but I believe the party has seen cases where uh, business groups trying to shape uh, the personnel decisions, either at the local, regional, or even central level, uh, because it has been uh, mentioned in different uh, party policy documents in terms of anti-corruption, and has been repeatedly mentioned and it's even written in the television shows uh, about politician uh, about businessmen trying to nominate their own uh, candidates for certain political posts uh, that's something i think the, the party is really concerned and alerted about and the party has identified certain sectors as you said uh, uh, the first sector is a financial sector and then also uh, uh, the political legal, uh, legal institutions, uh, grain supplies, uh, these sectors will be the focus for the next round of anti-corruption campaign, including the anti-corruption agencies themselves. So they need a self-cleaning of the CCDI because it has grown so powerful uh, in the last 10 years. I think a, a, a campaign on itself is called for. Uh, uh, why it has been moving from one sector to another one, uh, it's, I think it's, it's like all party campaigns, which is you mobilize resources and focus all the mobilized resources in one particular target so that you can generate a higher deterrence level by uh, bumping up the arrest and conviction rate, and you have limited resources. And if you spread out in all sectors, one is uh, impact will be too wide, too systematic, and may paralyze the government. And second, you will thin out the investigative resources. So it makes sense for them to focus on one sector and then move on to another. So I've got to land the plane here, um, Paul. Let me let me give the last word to you here. I don't want to turn back to the uh, back to the U.S. Um, you know, notwithstanding the fact that the U.S. government right now seems to be very very focused on the challenges in the banking sector in the U.S. and potentially in Europe, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, it's not lost on anyone. The news headlines last night as well about TikTok. Um, and uh, the U.S. demand that uh, that TikTok either be divested or could get banned. Um, and you know, you mentioned the Select Committee on um, on China, and notwithstanding perhaps that the chairman has been uh, you know downplayed the trip to Taiwan a little bit, and so on and so forth. You know, those hearings are going to going to continue. Um, what do you see next out of U.S. policy on uh, on China? Yeah, so I think the key thing to look look at going forward in terms of foreign policy, of course, is what what happens with respect to China, this, these concerns about China providing lethal assistance to Russia. I think this is a very, well, let me say this way, I think the U.S. government sees it as a very serious issue um, at a time where, you know, there's been a lot of effort, as you know, and a lot of money. Um, and a lot of support given by the U.S. and Europe to try to help uh, Ukraine defend itself. If China moves forward in some way, and there's some indications that they might try to do it through a third party, they may try to cover it up so that uh, it's not seen, and there's ways that they can do that. Um, but if it's, if it's discovered, if it's identified, and it can be proven, um, and this is an issue too, because for the Chinese at the end of the day, what they need is really just plausible deniability. Um, but uh, if if it if it comes to comes to you know be that uh, Ch China takes this decision to do that, um, I think you're going to to see. I, I feel like Capitol Hill is spring loaded uh, to launch sanctions on China. They'll work with uh, European partners to do the same. And you'll see a setup where you've got the U.S. and Europe on one side helping Ukraine, and and uh, this is what I heard in D.C. when I was there. In a sense, a, 
a proxy war with uh, China, the facade of being neutral uh, on Ukraine would go away and clearly would align uh, with Russia. That is of concern and I think is of significant concern. If we can avoid that, um, I laid out a scenario where we've got APEC by the end of the year and maybe the two sides can, can find a uh, better footing. U.S. Select Committee will continue its work um, and you know we saw the first hearing uh, in prime time um, and I think they'll continue to move forward. I think the quest key question for me and the, for the committee um, is, is it gonna be mostly for a political show or is the committee gonna find a way to be helpful in providing useful and constructive examination of US-China relations that ultimately results in more effective foreign policy down the road? That should be the goal. Uh, but again, we're talking about uh, Capitol Hill, and as you saw, the first session was in prime time. So uh, we may see more of the uh, of these uh, hearings. Uh, they'll be, uh, you know, they may be sensational in watching them. Uh, but we need to, as a country, work with uh, our partners abroad. We need to deal with the challenges in a way, frankly, to defend and, and advance U.S. interests. And that should be the focus of uh, U.S. Select Committee on China. But we'll see going forward. Open my final question. question. My final question for you, Paul. Then is this: What are you advising, or what would your general advice be then to corporate leaders who, as we talked about, are probably going to be encouraged and need for their business purposes to get back to China soon? Um, but you know, being seen as overly friendly with China could get you hauled in front of that select committee to testify. Um, how do you thread that needle effectively? Got to be pretty fraught. Yeah, I think the the, the challenge is, uh, you know, as one CEO said to me recently, and I think I shared this with you, you know, CEOs used to be able to, you know, just know their business, you know, know their customers well, uh, and and could be successful. In this day and age, if the, the geopolitics is really having a huge impact on what they do, and so you've got to track these developments and then develop strategies to to try to thread the needle. It's getting increasingly uh, more difficult, especially in the U.S.-China context. And we saw that recently when the U.S. ambassador went to the American Chamber of Commerce you know, annual gala dinner, uh, gave a speech, and then the Chinese Global Times wrote an article saying that members of the American Chamber of Commerce staff were embarrassed by uh, U.S. ambassador's uh, wolf warrior rhetorics. So, you know, that... there is. <laughs> There's an attempt to kind of drive a wedge, in a sense, between the U.S. business community and the U.S. government action. And so it's going to continue to get trickier and trickier, and you got to track it, follow these issues closely, and develop strategies to, to deal with those challenges. Well, we are out of time, and obviously we've had an ongoing series talking about China and China-U.S. relations. We will continue to do so as events warrant over the course of the year. But for now, I want to thank everybody for joining. I want to thank... Professor Lee for joining us today from Vienna, Paul Hanley from, from Singapore, and Gabe Wildow, who is today making his 15th appearance on this program. Um, just goes to show how important China is to, uh, to us and our, and our audience. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Uh, until next time, I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York. Have a great day.